Our guest today is Professor Chandra Hill, whose research focuses on social television, which is a combination of social media and television. Chandra, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So uh, many people tweet as they were watching TV shows. Uh, why is this so important to the media industry, uh, both as part of figuring out <clears throat> how many people are actually watching a show, uh, and also why does this matter to advertisers? So there are a number of reasons why it's interesting and also important. Um, the first one is that for TV shows, um, they can observe in real time um, immediate response and engagement to the content in the show, whether that be um, sort of organic response to just the script or um, TV shows actually incorporating social media content in the shows and asking people to do, for example, voting um, while watching TV. But then in addition to um, looking at real-time engagement, one could also look at the viewers and estimate things like demographics, interest, and get a sense for who the people are that are actually watching the TV show. So Nielsen has just announced that we'll start providing demographic data. Uh, why is this notable, and, or is it really notable? Well, we've been estimating demographics from tweets for, for quite a long time. Um, as the tweets relate to television viewers and um, television content. So while it's notable in that it's an added service for, for Nielsen customers, um, it's something that can actually be done with publicly available data um, for free. And what's nice about it is that um, if you have a methodology to infer demographics of groups or individuals, you can do so for a really large number of people and Twitter handles. So Twitter handles represent shows and brands. Um, and so what's nice about the ability to actually infer demographics is that you can do so for a wide range of um, Twitter handles, more so than um, the popular televisions that television shows that Nielsen typically follows. Can you tell us a little bit more about your approach and how it differs from what Nielsen has uh, announced that it's going to do? Well, so our approach um, works in the following way. So we start with uh, Twitter handles. So usually we focus on television shows and brands, but the Twitter handles can represent anyone. For example, I could use the Twitter handle of, of, of my account. Um, and we start with those Twitter handles. And for the Twitter handles, we grab the followers of the Twitter handle. For those followers, we grab their tweets. And so each Twitter handle then in our method is represented by all of the tweets of all of the followers. So you can think of this as for a particular show, we have all of the follower tweets, not just tweets about the show, but tweets about their daily lives. Um, once we have this document, if you will, of all of the tweets of the followers of a particular handle, then we basically create what's called a bag of words. So think of it as just creating, you know, one big vector of words and the associated counts with them. Um, we then correlate the counts, so we, we normalize the counts in a special way, but we correlate the counts on these words with aggregate level demographics of the shows. So we get this data in an interesting way um, from Facebook through the um, Facebook advertising API, which allows us to get estimates of the aggregate level proportions of people that follow a particular thing. It could be a television show, like I mentioned, or um, a, a brand or a person. And what we do is correlate the proportions of people that follow a brand or television or person with these words and find the words that are correlated with different proportions of demographics. So examples of those demographics that we've looked at are gender, um, age, education level. Um, but then in addition to that, Facebook also allows you to target um, different interests, so people with different interests. So we could even look at um, estimates of the population for people that like gardening, for example, or cooking. Um, and so what's fascinating is even at this aggregate level where we take the words associated with these shows, the people that, you know, the words associated with the people that follow the shows, and these aggregate level demographics, we can do a really good job when we build models to correlate the words and the demographics at predicting the demographics of held out groups of people. Um, and so why this is so powerful is that you don't have to restrict yourself to just popular things that you know perhaps a company like Nielsen would typically 
have estimates for, or reliable estimates. You can make estimates for just about anything that has a group of people that talk about their daily lives, that you can sort of isolate this group. So speaking of that, you, ha you have something that you call the tocographic profile. Right, right. Can you explain exactly what that is and how so it works? So we've just coined this term to basically mean that people are what they say. So groups and individuals, um, you know, sort of use specific language on Twitter and on social media. And basically, they are what they say. So words that um, people use are highly indicative of both their demographics and interests. Now, the Nielsen service offers demographic data to industry. But your approach takes it one step further and actually makes recommendations based on the data. Uh, how do you do that? And why is it different? than traditional recommendation systems. Right, so we have built a recommendation engine on top of what we call these profiles for shows. Um, and so we wanted to show that these profiles actually had value. And so what we do is simply calculate the similarity between shows, or really Twitter handles, based on the words that people who follow the shows say. So. Um, in doing so, we can calculate the similarity between anything, any Twitter handle. And when we um, have a new set of users, we can then sort of give one of the shows or Twitter handles that that user follows into our big correlation matrix of items or shows and ask, based on the similarity between this item that we give our system and all of the calculations that we've done, what are the things that that user would most likely follow? And we find that calculating the similarity between shows in this way, just using the words, um, is, is highly predictive um, when we sort of build this recommendation engine predicting what people will follow. And so the nice thing about this is while um, there are a lot of strategies for building recommendation engines, so for example, using um, the product network or the network of Twitter handles that form by looking at um, Twitter handles that are commonly followed by a lot of people. Um, in using the text, it means that you don't need those networks. So while Twitter has um, a large network of users, there are a lot of websites that don't, right? And so here it's saying that um, perhaps the, the tweets or text can be used as a substitute for those network data when it's not there. And when it is there, it can be used to complement it. In addition to kind of showing the value there, it also helps with the, what's called a cold start problem for recommendation engines. And um, basically, what exactly is yeah, that? so this problem is when you have an item or a product, or in the case of TV, as we're talking about now, that doesn't really have that many um, followers, um, then you'd, you're not going to recommend it. Right? So it's quicker to get these tweets. You only need a few followers to start you know, calculating the similarity between the Twitter handles. Um, so it'll be more likely to be recommended sooner. Um, and it also tends towards making more diverse recommendations, so as opposed to making sort of more popular recommendations um, in terms of our methodology that we've developed. So c can you give me an example of uh, a specific instance where you've been able to make some recommendations using your recommendation engine and what the results were? Um, so we test this on um, Twitter users. Um, and so we're assuming that the things that Twitter uh, users follow are representative of the things that they're interested in. So we basically build our models on one subset of users and then make predictions on a holdout set of users. So we've done this in the context of television shows reliably. And then we've also done this in the context of brands. So. Um, so we focus mostly on television shows and brands. But because we're using um, all of the words that people say without um, going in with any ontology, meaning you know s some list of words, um, which would be a lexicon, or like relationships between known words that are meaningful for television or brands, our approach is generalizable. So we take all of the words that people say without restricting them in any way. Um, and what that means is we can calculate the similarity between any two things, not just television shows, not just brands. Um, and so it, it, it makes the approach very flexible. So could a company or a brand use your approach in-house? And if so, how would they go about it? 
Absolutely. I mean, so what's nice about the approach that that we've developed is um, it relies strictly on publicly available data, So, which means the data are free. Um, so we've tested our approach on uh, Twitter users that have revealed their preferences by following. There would still be this extra step needed for a firm to test it in their particular context. Um, but if they are trying to just infer the demographics of Twitter users, then it would work that way. But if they wanted to use the approach for making recommendations in their context, they would have to test it against um, their own users. Now, TechCrunch's story about Nielsen's new offering says that the company has found that while there are a significant number of people tweeting about TV, an even larger number are consuming that content, and sometimes those consumers shed new light on what type of demographic groups watch a particular show. Uh, have you seen that in your research? And why is it so important to tease out passive tweet readers along with people who are actively creating content? Right. So we haven't we haven't focused on that distinction, um, mostly because we uh, decide that somebody's interested in a show based on the fact that they follow that show, not based on the fact that they're tweeting about it. Um, and so all of the users that follow a show would be in our data set, both those that actively tweet and those that don't. We could easily compare them. My guess is that they're not extremely different, but perhaps they are, but we could compare them pretty easily. Um, so the nice thing about that would be, like, if there are, in fact, differences, then it would provide insights to um, a company. But we focused mostly on, you know, of the people that follow your brand, can we infer, or TV show, can we infer the overall demographics? But it would be easy because our approach um, infers information for groups of users to infer the demographics of the subset of people that tweet and the subset of people that don't for a particular show. Got it. Uh, and finally, one last question. People both in and outside the media industry have complained for years that the traditional system of Nielsen ratings doesn't accurately count how many people are actually watching the show. Uh, what are the stakes here, and why is doing that so important? Uh, how can social media be a game changer in this? So the main thing is that the way um, that you can easily collect the data and sort of watch viewers um, enables us to watch a larger number of viewers for free and therefore make inferences about a larger number of users and TV shows for free. So most of the criticism of Nielsen data, there, there are many, but many, one of the main ones is that there's not a lot of coverage for niche shows or shows that aren't that popular because the way that historically they've collected data is based on a relatively small panel of users that have a device in their home to track their viewing patterns. And so what social media does is it opens up the space of users to pretty much anybody that's that's tweeting. And so you're not restricted then to infer only the demographics of popular shows because there will be coverage for all shows and all things on Twitter. Now, say that with the main caveat that not everybody's on Twitter, right? And so there's going to be a bias um, of course, um, if you use sort of only the social media data. So while you can make inferences for a larger number of shows, um, you're going to be biased and you'll have to correct for that bias of the fact that not everybody is on Twitter, it skews younger, um, and that has to be accounted for. But the promise is that you, know, you can make inferences cheaper, faster, um, for more people, and for more shows. Would you like to say anything about a question that I should have asked but I haven't? So I think, Maybe just talking about sort of the future and predicting maybe what all this means for the TV industry. So it's nice um, to see Nielsen and other companies beginning to combine different types of data to make more comprehensive pictures of their, their viewing audience. Um, but what would be nice to see from companies like Nielsen are um, partnerships with data um, having partnerships with people that have different types of data that the masses couldn't otherwise get. So with Twitter, you know, sort of inferring demographics is something that we do. It's something that um, a lot of researchers now are starting to do for various reasons. And so that's kind of easy. 
Um, what would be nice to see would be now, you know, perhaps customers wouldn't want this, but to see them do things like partner with credit card companies and partner um, with companies for which it's really difficult to get that data and see sort of what insights can be drawn about TV viewers from combining um, data from disparate sources that, you know, aren't easy to get. Great. Chandra, thanks so much for speaking with us today. Sure. Thanks.